Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to this plenary keynote. The night sky, the planets, the stars, and the universe fascinated and inspired mankind since we came to Earth without it knowing much about their properties or their origin, our ancestors used them as tools for development, including timekeeping and navigations, among others. They also enriched our popular cultures around the world. As an expert and accomplished scientist in astronomy and astrophysics, Maria Roos will highlight recent revolutions in our understanding of the universe, the privilege of our present time to have answered uh, questions and mysteries that puzzled our ancestors, and the joy of adding even more puzzling questions and mysteries to the future, uh, 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 for future uh, scientists to actually answer. Uh, Maria Ruz is a professor of astronomy at the University of Chile. She has an out outstanding record of achievement that includes the first person to receive a degree in astronomy from the University of Chile, uh, the first person to receive a PhD in astrophysics from Princeton, the first woman to receive uh, the Chile's National Prize in Exact Science, and the first female uh, scientist to head the Academy of Science in Chile. Most recently, she received the uh, L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science. This is last year. Uh, Maria Roos did her uh, research in the Teresta Observatory in Italy, in Mexico, at the Goddard Institute in uh, New York. Uh, and this was before she gained a uh, Guggenheim Fellowship. In 1997, uh, Professor Roos discovered one of the first free-floating brown dwarfs named Kilo One. Now she studies uh, brown dwarfs, their evolution and uh, formation process, which led to the search and the study of extrasolar planets. Hoping like every astronomer in the field, uh, uh, hoping to, to find one with a signature of life uh, in their atmosphere. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Maria Roos. Thank you, Ella, for that presentation. And uh, thank you, the organizer, for inviting me today to speak to talk about the universe. The knowledge of our universe has really progressed a lot in the last decades, hand in hand with the progress in technology. And now we are building better and more sensitive uh, instruments to observe the universe, to explore the universe, not only in the visual light, but in the radio, infrared, X-ray, gamma ray, and building new detectors and building new instruments, better instruments to explore the universe. And this is a worldwide effort. And uh, I just wanted to, I'm from Chile, so in, in the few years, about 70% of the, the power to observe the universe will be installed in Chilean territory. And I would like to just give you a, uh, explanation why. Well, one, the first reason is we are in the south. And if you look at the, at the globe of the earth, most of the continents are in the north. And so what you can see from the universe was relatively more explored from the north, while what you can see from the, of the universe from the south was very much unknown. So. Uh, the astronomers were looking for a good place in the Southern Hemisphere to do astronomy. And then in Chile, we have a, a, an area of very clear skies. Uh, I will show you why. And also uh, many mountains and uh, places that are very dry, which 
are very important for, when I say clear skies, it's important for optical astronomy where you don't want to have clouds, while uh, uh, for uh, radio observations in the millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths, you need a place that is dry because what absorbs the, that wavelength is humidity. Can be completely cloudy, but if the clouds are made of ice, no problem. So the reason is a geographical reason. Uh, I'm we have a, this is a picture of the coast of Chile, and there uh, I'm showing two of the European observatories in Chile. These are a, a one very near the, the border with Argentina and the other one in, near the coast. And what happened here is the ocean is very cold, so the clouds form over the ocean rather than on the continent, and then the mountains, the Andes Mountains, which are very high here, um, act, uh, prevent the, the humid clouds coming from the Atlantic to cross over. So we have a special uh, situation there where, you know, this, this place is considered like a, a special window to observe the universe. And many, many projects are being built there. So let me tell, uh, show you one of the observatories, uh, European, this is Paranal Observatory, is a European observatory. There are 14 European countries members of that. And this is the most modern observa optical observatory in the world. It's very powerful. It has four uh, eight meter telescope. And this picture shows one of these 8.2 meter telescopes uh, with a laser pointing to what is the center of the Milky Way. And what is that laser doing there? Well, we were very envious of pictures taken above the atmosphere because they look so perfect, so in focus, you know, so sharp, uh, taken with space telescope, for example. While in a perfectly clear night, if you have a light from a star coming, when it, it enters the atmosphere of the Earth, there is turbulence. And the ray gets bounced around, and finally, when it makes the image, it doesn't look really sharp. So what was invented it was this, <laughs> developed this, this uh, laser, sodium laser, that travels 90 kilometers from the, from the ground to a, um, a shell of, um, of uh, sodium that surrounds the Earth and excites the atoms of sodium and produces a false star. We know the shape of that star should have because we, we, we send it from here. When it comes back, it comes completely deformed by the turbulence. Uh, we what we do is that we uh, shine that, that laser really near the place we want to observe and hope that this, the, the light from that object we are interested in crosses the same atmospheric layers and suffers the same deformations. And so what we do is we, taking the laser image, we correct it to the correct form <clears throat> and we do it 30 times a second, and we apply the same corrections to the observations. And so we obtain that way really fantastic images. So uh, this is a European uh, optical observatory in, in Chile, one of them, because ISO has another one in Chile. And then ALMA. ALMA is a more international collaboration where you have <coughs> Europe, US, Canada, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, all of them working together to construct a really uh, fantastic instrument at 5,000 meter height of 66 antennas. Uh, it's an interferometer. In, in this uh, video, uh, we can see only the few antennas that were put in place now, all of them are working, the 66 one. And in the mountains surrounding the, this place, this is 5,000 to 5,200 meters, uh, are 
maybe 6,000 meters high. And there are other instruments from Princeton, from uh, University of Tokyo is building an instrument there almost at, at 6,000 meters high. So it's a fantastic place. Uh, very difficult to be there, to, to breathe there, to walk there. And these are the antennas already working now and taking data. Every time Alma looks at something, shows something we didn't know about, which is great. This is what you expect from these new instruments. So thanks to this, there are many other instruments in, in space being planned or working and in other places. I just show these two because are in my country and they are European instruments. And uh, in this journey, looking for our origins, it's, it's a journey in space and time, as, it, as uh, was said yesterday by Professor Solomon. It's, uh, we cannot uh, separate both quantities. And uh, everything is in the past. Actually, I could have disappeared here for a fraction of a second, and it will take that time, much time to, for you to realize it. Everything in, is in the past. And that is kind of an uncomfortable feeling. You know, sometimes students say, OK, but that star I'm studying is, may, not, may be dead. Yes. But we have not received the news yet. You know? So many of the objects there are probably dead. But we, we haven't received news about that event yet. And uh, that which gives you an uncomfortable feeling is also a fantastic tool to explore the universe. Because we, when we go further back in, uh, away in space, we go further back in time. So we can observe the past and uh, reconstruct the history of the universe our history, because we can see it. And one thing we, we learned is that the universe began in an event we call the Big Bang 13.76 uh, billion years ago. At the beginning, it was extremely hot. Uh, it started uh, getting cooler. Uh, what you see there in blue is hydrogen and helium that was formed very uh, soon after the Big Bang. In the denser parts, these clouds of helium and hydrogen collapsed by gravity and uh, formed galaxies and stars. And they are the ones who form all the other elements we know we are made of. So these galaxies that form uh, after the Big Bang, they, they form clusters of galaxies, of tens of thousands of galaxies. In this picture, all of them are galaxies, except those who have these crosses around, across which are stars. The rest are all galaxies, uh, and are galaxies of different types. This is our galaxy, our Milky Way uh, is taken well, we are in it, so it's difficult to see uh, the shape, except we see it in an edge on, and it has 100 billion stars, 10 to the 11. And uh, it's, um, the sun is a very common star. You know, the, most of the stars there are, are very much like the sun. Uh, if we could... If we could see our galaxy f from the front, we cannot go out of the galaxy. We cannot even go out of the solar system yet. But uh, if we could, it would look a little bit like this, like a, a whirlpool. And, and you can, with the, with the spiral arms. And we are, with the sun, more or less as, as halfway between the center and the edge and the, of the galaxy. And that is 28,000 uh, light years away. And just to put it in a everyday language, if I send a WhatsApp to a friend that lives in the, 
in a planet near the center of our own galaxy, it will take 28,000 years to get there. And when she sends a message back saying hello, it will take another 28,000 years to get to me. So you start realizing the problems of communication and, of course, travel in, in, in the universe, with the, at least with the science we know now. There are all kinds of galaxies. One of them is the radio galaxies. I, um, they, they don't look, this is the most beautiful radio galaxy, Centaurus A. And uh, this is uh, in, in the southern sky. And this is a, com a composite picture because it's optical, radio, and also these jets in X-ray. These jets are relativistic particles that are uh, uh, moving away from the galaxy, and we didn't know what produced those jets, except that with the space telescope, we could really look in the center of the galaxy and see what was going on there. And uh, this is a, an animation where, you know, it was a surprise when you pointed uh, the Hubble Space Telescope in the core of one of these radio galaxies and found that there was a disk of stars moving at 500 kilometers a second around something that looked like nothing was there. And you can calculate, you know, what force you have to exert to keep these stars moving this way and, not, not, and they would not just uh, spread and go away. And uh, they, f uh, they found that it was a, a thousand million solar masses. There's no way you have a, have a thousand million or a billion solar masses. So there, except if it is a black hole. And that was the answer. There is a really huge black hole in the center of these radio galaxies. And the matter, when it is falling into the black hole, has to get rid of the angular momentum, and you have these really uh, energetic jets. So that was a surprise, maybe more than, maybe 25 years ago. Now we know that all galaxies, even ours, have uh, black holes in their core, in their center. Ours has three million solar masses, is on where the, the red cross is, and is it closer so we can see the motion of the stars around the black hole and calculate the mass. Poor, our poor black hole is on a diet. It doesn't have a lot to eat. And so black holes, you can detect them because they, they have an influence on the motion of the stars around or because the matter is falling and produces high energy radiation. This one is mostly quiet. So how the stars form? Star form in a, in a nebula where it is a little bit denser and for gravity, it starts attracting more matter, more matter. It forms like a disk. In the center, it's very hot because you transform potential energy into thermal energy. When it gets to about 10 million degrees, nuclear reactions start and a star is born. In this simulation, there were two planets form at the same time. This was our view maybe five years ago or two years ago, three years ago. I don't remember when Alma finally settled this up because it wasn't a scenario, what we call it in, in, in astronomy. Uh, from the debris disk, planets form by, by collision uh, and different processes. And Alma, produced this fantastic picture of a very young star with a disk of debris. And you can see, you know, in the gaps there in the disk is where the planets are being formed and the debris is depleted there. And this is, well, now have been seen in many young stars and is a, one of the main subjects of study with ALMA. And uh, so we are corroborating that that is the right scenario of formation of planets and stars. The maternities where stars 
are born are beaut very beautiful, are this nebula, this is a reflection nebula in Orion, and the stars are being born in one of these very dark clouds in complete privacy from optical light, but if you go into infrared or millimeter waves like ALMA, these, obje these, these dark clouds are completely transparent and we can see what is going on. Uh, this is why all this instrument have been optimized to, for infrared and for a millimeter wave uh, because they give important information. The other question is, are there planets orbiting other stars? This is a woo, very old question of humanity. Uh, we now know there are many, many suns in our galaxy. Each of these galaxies have uh, many, uh, in the universe, there are more than 100,000 million galaxies. And uh, so the probability of having a planet and a planet with life is quite uh, high. The search for extra, extrasolar planets is very difficult. And here is just an example of a search that was done. Uh, these are all real stars near the center of our galaxy. So that's why there are so many stars. And you have to be lucky enough to find a star, which is, and at the end is a simulation, to be in a position where the star is in the line of sight. With us, there is a planet crossing the disk of the star and producing the light of the star to go down and then up again, and then down. And you can, with the period, you can calculate the mass and the size and some other. There are other methods, they are all difficult, and uh, the question is uh, uh, to find planets that may be uh, inhabitable. And the question is that we, all of these methods, look at the star and not the planets. So we don't really know how the, you know, really how the planet looks. This is a picture taken with the Cassini satellite that was studying uh, uh, Saturn and uh, uh, took the advantage that Saturn is covering the sun. And so he took a picture, a selfie, with a very long arm all the way to Saturn of our interior solar system. And there we are, at, although I know where it is, I almost cannot see it, but I will help you here. There we are, that's the Earth. And this is from inside our own solar system. So just to you know, show how difficult it is. And what we would wish to do is to put a spectrograph there and see how the atmosphere is, where it has a, uh, oxygen and uh, water, and maybe the, the, the signature of, of, uh, of a chlorophyll that you can see in the atmosphere of Earth to see if there is some kind of life there. Uh, so this is a difficult task, and that's why new instruments are being built. And this, again, is the, the European Extremely Large Telescope. It's also in Cerro Armazones in Chile. And uh, it's a huge monster. And one of its objectives is to f uh, study exoplanets that could have life. And uh, just to show you by comparison with, for, for, for the locals, you know, who are used to that huge Arc de Triomphe, uh, it's going to be even larger. And uh, the, the construction of this instrument is underway. And uh, in a few years, we will start seeing the universe through this new eye, which is going to show us probably something very different that we, always, always when we request financing a project, you have to say, what are you going to find? In this case, sometimes what you look, you, you really f interesting thing you find, you can't predict because it's unknown. And this is very exciting. This is another telescope that is being built in Chile, also from Carnegie, and many, many, it doesn't show here, but many 
other uh, universities, countries, everything, companies. Uh, these are very expensive instruments. And this is a 24.5, the other one is 39 meter. I don't know how much 39 meters is, but it's a lot. It's a lot, it's huge. This is 24.5, ooh, not so, I still have time. I went all the way to, okay. Okay, so we have to keep uh, watching the news because we will have probably news about new planets and what is in there in the future. And this is our, our star, the sun. This is a picture, uh, it's a video taken by the SOHO satellite during a week and it's accelerated just to see that the sun has ejections, and has a cycle of more or less 12 years, but could be 11, can be 13. It has been time in the past when the sun takes a break and doesn't really, the, the, the dynamo doesn't really start, and uh, we are in trouble. I'm always worried because I'm not a solar astronomer, but I always complain because the sun is the most important stellar object we should really be looking at and studying it for many reasons. And it's, it's not a very popular area of astronomy. Our sun is, uh, the fuel of the sun is uh, conversion, nuclear reaction is like a bomb, uh, converting hydrogen into helium. It doesn't explode because gravity opposes that, that force and that's that's why the sun has the size that it has, or all the stars. But once the, 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 the fuel ends, when all the hydrogen be converted to helium, then the, the star will start collapsing again. It will uh, heat the core to two, two, uh, 100 uh, million degrees. At that point, you transform helium into carbon. Once you develop a carbon core, it will try to do the same trick again and collapse to see if it can burn the carbon. But carbon burns at 600 million degrees and it doesn't reach that temperature as start small as the sun. So what you are, uh, the end is a, it's a very uh, dense core of carbon, made of carbon. So when is the, uh, the first step, the, the, the end of the life of the sun will be uh, in, in 5,000 million years from now. But the sun already transformed half of its fuel into hydro, uh, helium and is sitting there. The, the, the sun is becoming uh, hotter and hotter, uh, getting s smaller and um, I think we have about 900 million years, or probably less. In 900 million years, there would be no water in the surface of the Earth because the sun would be too, too hot. Everything would have been evaporated, and would, this planet would look more like Venus with more than 400 degrees temperature and all of the water in the atmosphere. This is, uh, so we have if maybe 100 million years to to try to find another house because this planet is not going to be nice. So what the end of a, a life of a star like our sun is, would look like this. It, at the center is a very dense core, more or less the size of the earth, size of the earth made of carbon. And the, the interesting part is that the, the, the last phases of their life, the, these stars eject a lot of material that is contamin contaminated with what they form. Star, small stars that, like the sun form carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So all the material they, they eject is, contains this uh, enriched in these elements. And that material gets mixed with what the Big Bang did 
which is most of the material we have in the universe, which is hydrogen and helium, and you will have a new generation of stars that already had all of uh, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. I mention this because those are very important for life. And what happened with the more massive star, about eight times more massive? They can burn the, the calcium and go all the way to iron. Once they form an, a nucleus of nickel, uh, uh, iron, uh, they are in trouble because once they collapse to try to form something more complex, iron absorbs energy instead of giving away energy and then gravity wins and you have a very uh, dramatic collapse and then ejection, which is called a supernova uh, explosion. The material collapses, bounces back and is ejected. In that process, all of the other ele elements more complex than iron are formed. Gold, uh, all the way to copper and all the way to, to uranium. So in order for us to be talking here, we need all of these different types of stars to, to enrich the material of the universe. And this is the last supernova we saw in our galaxy. This is the Crab Nebula. It was in the Northern Hemisphere. It was reported by the Chinese at that time in the year 1054 and by the Native Americans who made pictures in rocks because it was so bright, almost as bright as the full moon. So for them it was very impressive. And it's bright for about a week or so and then it starts fading slowly. Now we can only see it with a parallel observatory like this. So start fabricate all the chemical elements we know in their surroundings, nebula, and uh, especially organic molecules, the molecules you have in the DNA. The basic material is everywhere in the universe. There is a nebula which is very interesting for the students because it it's called happy hour. It's con it contains ethyl alcohol, it contains ice, and with ALMA they have discovered a, a element that is very uh, similar to sugar. So we have all the elements for a, a good cocktail. But uh, this is a, the, the road going up to Alma, which is a beautiful place. You have these cactus that look like fingers pointing at the center of the galaxy. It's a beautiful. So, you know, the, the universe had produced, the stars have produced all the elements for life. The, with ALMA, ALMA only can see molecules, and most of the molecules that, that sees ALMA are not identified. We don't know what they are. And just to give you an example, carbon-60 was discovered in a dying star in the Magellanic clouds in a different galaxy, one of the, our nearby galaxies. And that is, uh, you know, really an interesting fact. We hope that we will continue to find more molecules and the whole field of astrochemistry is open. And this is a picture of myself with my son and my grandson. And just to stress the fact that this is my history. This is my family tree and yours. We all come from the same family of stars that have produced all the elements, not just one star before the sun was born, but probably many, many generations, and also small ones and big ones that exploded as a supernova, and they all produced uh, the material to, for life. And uh, this is, a, at least for me, it gives me a, a message. You know, We are made of the same stuff. And although we think we are very different, we are actually the same. We have the same origin in the Big Bang, the same ancestors, the stars, the same stars. We probably share the same dreams, pretty much, and we definitely face the same destiny. If we don't put our act together, 
we may not survive. And it's a, we are here in, in, a, in a planet that we think is very, everything is controlled, the scientists probably know everything, and that's absolutely not the case. In any time, uh, the sun can do something that will change completely our way of life. And we have to be prepared for that. Uh, or, or a comet or an asteroid, things that we think we can handle, maybe not, maybe yes. I think if we get together, we can do it. And in that sense, I think astronomy, science, and in this case, astronomy, is a fantastic example. When you see in ALMA, the Americans with the Europeans, several European countries, you know, with different cultures, um, Japan, uh, Europe, Canada, US, Taiwan, you realize, you know, and they all work together. And just with one objective, to explore the universe. So I think, you know, that at least gives me hope that we can, when we get together, we can do fantastic things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Maria Ruz. Um, if you have uh, questions, uh, you have the chance actually to, uh, to meet Dr. Maria Ruz uh, this evening at 6.30, meeting with a prof. Uh, it's in the level minus one, the Agora Square area, in the same exhibit level. So this is a good uh, chance for you to have a 30 minutes or even more uh, uh, with Dr. Ruz in all the questions that you might have in your mind. Thank you very much for coming to the event.